I remember right? So when we talk about the cardiac induction system, keep in mind it's a series of modified cardiac muscles that act very similar to neurons. So you have these autorhythmic cells and you have to make sure when you stimulate one part of the cell, you don't stimulate the whole heart. Because the last thing you want to do is stimulate all four chambers at the same time. You want the top two, the atria to contract first, then the bottom two, top two, and then the bottom two. So you have to disconnect those. How? By that fiber skeleton. Now, I've mentioned that a lot, so you might see it on your test somehow, right? Especially the fiber skeleton. So you have this cardiac induction system. And it allows us to have a way of triggering when these atria contract, delaying then the signal, allowing the atria to contract and then relax, blood to go from the atria to the ventricles and then relax. Once that happens, then we stimulate the ventricles. So there's a slight delay when we're talking about this. Keep in mind, when we mention the delay, it makes it sound like it's going to be a long time, but it's actually going to be incredibly fast at delay. So, cardiac induction system, the SA node goes to the AV node, right? The SA node's main purpose is to stimulate the atria. The AV node's main purpose is to stimulate the ventricles. I'm just going to beat this a lot. will hear and see bundle branch blocks when we look through an ECG, and I swear to God, I hope nobody here has that, or else you're going to give me a bundle branch block as we go through the ECGs tonight. So if you have any issues with cardiac rhythm, you guys are all pretty young, I don't expect this, but you never know, right? Again, we kind of mentioned the plateau phase. By the time we got through this, I know you guys were kind of tired. so. Keep in mind that in terms of the electrical properties of the cardiac cells, these are specifically the cardiac muscles, not any of the nodes, not the AV or the SA node. This is just the cardiac muscle. What happens to the cardiac muscle? You need to stimulate, and then you need to kind of keep that stimulation for a long period of time. Now, this is all dependent on a couple things. One, understanding that from the previous contraction, you ejected blood, some of the blood then returned back from the aortic arch. As that blood returned back from the aortic arch, it opened up, it actually closed up the aortic and the pulmonic valves. So then there's blood sitting on top of those valves. So the only way to open that <coughs> valve is to pre create pressure from below. If you create enough pressure from below, you have enough pressure to eject blood, open the valves, and move whatever remaining of amount of blood that's sitting on top of the valves forward, right? But you need to create that pressure. You start off at zero millimeters of pressure in the ventricles when it's relaxed. You need to even, you know, to even open the valve, the aortic valve, you need to get to be about 80, 85 millimeters of mercury. So you somehow have to create that tension from zero to 85 just to open the aortic valve. And then you have to keep contracting to actually eject blood over and over again. So then you can bring blood to the brain and the rest of the body. So you need a prolonged contraction time. And that's what the plateau phase allows us to do. So then what happens? Now we have this prolonged plateau phase lots of calcium coming in, you have more calcium in the cardiac muscles, so then you can contract and contract and contract and sustain that contraction. All it takes is one depolarization, but it lasts a long time, each depolarization. That allows you to then eject blood out. So that is the big difference here, is that in skeletal muscles, when we contract the muscle, the stronger the contraction, the more tetanic contraction we need, the more activations, so more action potentials in a very fast time frame. Well, in the heart, that will cause our heart to keep beating and beating and beating, and now we're going to have an arrhythmia. Instead, what we want to do is depolarize at one time, 
and now it's going to depolarize for 250 times as long. So you have a much longer phase where you are depolarizing and that coincides with a long, much longer period of time that you can contract. And that's all due to voltage-gated calcium channels and calcium coming in. So once calcium comes in, it prolongs our action potential, it prolongs our contraction. So then we can sustain that pressure from zero to 120. Now, this is slightly different. So before we talked, I think we ended with this, where that calcium coming in allows more calcium release from the cerebroplasmic reticulum, which then allows us to have even longer contraction. The next thing though, here is solely based on the SA node firing. So what happens with the SA node firing? We hit like minus 60 millivolts from the previous contraction, right? So the SA node fired the last time, the skeletal, the cardiac muscle started to contract, and now it's relaxed. Now we're getting ready for the next contraction phase. What happens? As soon as the SA node hits minus 60, voltage-gated sodium channels open up. And the sodium starts to rise, and it starts to come into the cell. Again, right? Threshold is still at minus 55 millivolts, so it doesn't have to go far to hit threshold. So as it goes upwards right here, sodium goes into the SA node, and what happens is eventually we hit threshold. As threshold is reached, voltage-gated calcium channels open. Again, calcium being very important for the cardiac muscle depolarization as well as for the SA node depolarization. In the SA node, calcium is what causes the whole depolarization phase. Everywhere else in the body, it's sodium, right? Except the ear where you might have a little bit of potassium. But almost always it's sodium. Here, it's calcium. Calcium influx causes depolarization. You guys know I love talking about some of these differences, right? When it's different, well, that makes it novel and unique something that you might want to know of them on the test. So here, when we depolarize, is caused by calcium influx, causing the depolarization phase. As it depolarizes, that signal, right, then gets sent to the atrial cardiac muscles. The atrial cardiac muscles then depolarizes as well, and now you can have a contraction. As you depolarize and you stimulate the atrias, the <clears throat> SA node then repolarizes, and that's still due to potassium. So potassium, voltage-gated potassium channels open, potassium leaving, potassium leaving causes us to become negative. So in every single instance, potassium efflux always repolarizes, right? Every single instance, even in cardiac muscle, even in the ear, right? So every instance is potassium efflux out that causes repolarization. The difference here is that, number one, this is specific to the SA node. Number two, it's calcium causing depolarization phase. Now, the pacemaker potential is that rise from minus 60 to minus 55, the threshold. Now, the pacemaker potential can increase in slope. So slope, if you remember, is just how fast, right, this level kind of goes. Now, if I want to increase my heart rate, right, I would have the slope, instead of being this kind of slanted, up a little bit. So then I'll activate more voltage-gated sodium channels, and I hit threshold earlier. As I hit threshold earlier, then I depolarize with voltage-gated calcium channels. So instead of depolarizing way over here, I'll depolarize over here. When that happens, right, I'll start my next contraction earlier, which then causes the next contraction to start earlier. What happens then? Now I can increase my heart rate. So increasing the heart rate is due to increasing the slope of this pacemaker potential, right? So then it hits threshold earlier. As it hits threshold earlier, you depolarize and repolarize earlier. 
then you can have your next contraction earlier, which allows us to speed up our heart rate. Now, we will see refractory periods as well. Remember, in a neuron, a refractory period is a period where it's harder to stimulate. The absolute refractory period is a period where no matter what you do, you can't re-stimulate it. Why? It's so that, all right, it's because in the absolute refractory period, voltage-gated channels are still open. So if your voltage-gated calcium channels are open, you're in the middle of an action potential. So what happens? Well, you can't re-stimulate it because you're in the middle of one. The relative refractory period requires a greater sensitivity. So you need a stronger stimulus. Now, what would cause us to have a stronger stimulus? Well, more epinephrine release. More epinephrine and norepinephrine release. So when you're exercising or when you're scared, you have epinephrine and norepinephrine release into your bloodstream. What happens? It allows us, us then to increase the number of sodium channels that open in the SA node, which then allows us to hit threshold earlier which then allows us to increase our heart rate. All because of, right, this increase release of norepinephrine increases the sensitivity, so then we have a stronger stimulus, which is what we want when we're scared or excited. <clears throat> Cardiac muscles have long refractory periods, preventing tetanic contractions, preventing arrhythmias. Now, I'm gonna show you some videos here, and keep in mind, for some reason when I download it, the videos don't work well on the PowerPoint. So, this is all on our, there's that video, there's our new website you'll out there. This is, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, terrible. It's, it's terrible, isn't it? It makes it really hard to even for me to find it. Although if you're on the main screen, just scroll all the way down. All the way, is it? Yeah, I think it's probably it's still there. Now, let's take a look, Stephen, about this. Let me see. From McGraw Hill. Right here. Now, with the videos, it's all on anatomy and physiology reveal, and it should look like this. And if you don't have a chance to go to open lab, this is not bad resource, right? There's anatomy and physiology revealed, especially for the heart. Now for like the scalpel, it's terrible, right? For muscular, it's okay, but for the heart, it is not bad at all. <coughs> so we can talk about the head and neck. Again, right, don't do this in front of your kids. They will freak out. Don't, do, you know, open this if you're in that Starbucks right people <laughs> will freak out i've had students like they do this they're like yeah they, can't, they didn't like it when i went to starbucks and opened it i'm like ah, i wonder why right <laughs> so you can see like the external jugular internal jugular here you can see the common <coughs> carotid here right the internal carotid the external carotid the superficial temporal so all of this you can kind of see here uh, I don't know, do you guys want me to do a video on this? I sound like I'm gonna do a YouTube video. All right, so kind of going through that. <laughs> right. I sound dirty. I mean, <laughs> I just said that, I just said it like that too. Did you, like, do you guys want me, want me to do a video? <laughs> Comment below. Right. So all this is on here for us to use. Um, the good thing about it is the actual animations, right? So I'm gonna show you the animation of the cardiac cycle. And the crazy thing is, we talk about it, but when you think about it, it takes much longer to even think about what's happening than for the actual muscle and everything to contract. Remember, it's at least contracting once a second. When you're exercising, it's happening two and a half times a second, right, if your heart rate is at 150. So it is amazing how fast all of this is working. The cardiac cycle is the sequence of contraction and relaxation of the heart chambers during a single heartbeat. 
the contraction of the heart chambers is called systole and relaxation of the heart chambers is called diastole. The cycle begins with both the atria and ventricles in diastole. Both atrioventricular valves are open while the pulmonary and aortic semilunar valves are closed. Blood flows into the right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava. Blood flows from the lungs into the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Then blood moves from both atria into the ventricles through the open atrioventricular valves. During atrial systole, the atria contract and force any remaining atrial blood into the ventricles. The ventricles are still in diastole, allowing them to expand and completely fill with blood. During ventricular systole, the ventricles contract. The atrioventricular valves close, preventing backflow or regurgitation of blood into the atria. The pulmonary semilunar valve opens and the right ventricle expels blood into the pulmonary arteries to the lungs. Likewise, the aortic semilunar valve opens and the left ventricle expels blood into the aorta and out to the rest of the body. After ventricular systole, the cardiac cycle begins again as both the atria and ventricles enter diastole to allow the heart to fill with blood. Normally, this cycle repeats 60 to 100 times a minute. It's not bad video, right? Kind of talks slow, so right. it's the only thing. You process it. So um, let me just show you the cardiac conduction system here. And again, what I want you to realize is just how fast it's really happening. Right, we can discuss it, and by discussing it, we kind of slow things down, right? But in reality, it is happening very fast. Action potentials originate in the sinuatrial SA node and travel across the wall of the atrium from the sinuatrial node to the atrioventricular AV node. 